It always confused me how people want to run away to the countryside. It seems so romantic to city people. The idea of rolling fields or forests becoming one with nature, whatever that means. That's not completely true, I mean. I've been confused about it since I started working out here. I decided to take a gap here, you know, get out of the city. I thought it would be good for me, I guess. My parents had suggested it, since they know my aunt has friends, Jim and Luane, who live out in the country on a sheep farm. And I thought, what could be better than that? Well, a lot of things actually. Being a farmhand kind of blows. Call me a city slicker all you want, but there's just something unappealing about shoveling crap out of a barn. And the sheep are cute at least, so it could be worse. So, here I am I guess. The farmhouse is nice enough, if a little dusty and spider ridden. My aunt's friends are good folks when they aren't trying to set me up with her daughter, Prudence. And the pay is pretty decent if I can stomach the crap smell. James is a good teacher and I'm a good learner so he got me up to snuff on my duties quickly. Feeding the sheep, mucking out the barn, and hanging around the pasture to make sure none of them get eaten. James and Luane and their son, Dashiell, handle shearing the sheep. It's the spring thaw, so they're happy to have extra hands around to help since Jim's shoulder has been bugging him and it's good to feel needed. I spend a lot of time outside in the pasture with these sheep and their dog, Ace. I'm not always alone. Sometimes a Dash comes around to chat and share coffee. I'm glad that he comes around. I feel safer when he's there, since he actually knows what he's doing. It's easy to feel how alone you are when you're in the pasture, especially since it's wet season and there's a fog in the air near it constantly. When I'm on the far end of the pasture, I can hardly see the house off in the distance. I found it pretty peaceful the first few days, sipping coffee and watching these sheep graze without a care in the world. On the sixth day, Dashiell comes up to me with a job. He's carrying a box of tools under his arm, wearing his lined jacket and that big crooked tooth smile on his face. Mad Jack, Dad said there's an old well in the woods, he says. Yeah, what about it? I asked. He said that he wants me to go uncover it for him so he can take a look at it. He doesn't want to head out to do it on his own because of his shoulder, so he wants me to get it ready for him. He pauses for a moment, rubbing his nose. You wanna come? It's a decent break from standing around in the fields. Dash is good for conversation and the woods are just beginning to come alive after the thaw. It's pretty beautiful this time of year, and the air is cool but not freezing. The birds are chirping in the trees. It feels like a real breath of fresh air. And we find the clearing pretty quickly. There's a big stone wall in the middle of it, boarded up by decaying planks of wood. Moss clings to the stone and wood in patches, while the grass is dead all around it. The bird song sounds further away here, off in the distance. An uneasy feeling settles over me. I look up at Dash, but it doesn't seem like he cares, since he just walks up to the well. He wraps his knuckles on the wood. It looks drenched and rotting, since it's been raining the past few nights. Doesn't look too hard to open up, he muses, setting his toolbox down and rummaging through it. My hair is standing up on end for some reason. It feels like I'm being watched almost. I shuffle closer to Dash and keep an eye on the tree line. He pulls out a claw hammer. It looks comically small for his massive workman hands. He starts with the nearest board to him and he pries it off easily. The rotting wood splitting around the nails holding it down onto the stone. The other boards come off just as easy. Dash appears down the well. I join him. I almost get a feeling of vertigo at how deep the well is. A shiver runs down my spine. 
a feeling of cold dread settling in my gut. I glance at Dash again, and again, it doesn't seem like he notices anything wrong. Welp, that sure is a well, he says blandly, laughing at his own joke. I try to laugh along, but it's weak at best. Ah, uh, yeah, it is. Should we go back and get Jem? I ask, taking a few steps back from the well. He nods his agreement as he packs up his toolbox again, and I immediately feel relieved. The whole walk home, I feel like something is watching us, but I don't say anything. The rest of the day goes over as normal. Watching the sheep, mucking out the barn, feeding the sheep, watering the sheep. The whole time, I can feel something watching me from the woods. Every time the woods are in sight, it's like I can see something just out of the corner of my vision. But there's nothing there. There's nothing there. I feel safer when I'm in the house. As the day moves into night and we have our dinner, I almost completely forget about it, and I retire to my room. They've converted the attic into a guest room. It gets a little bit cold at night and I don't have a ton of space, but the bed is warm and soft and I sink into sleep easily. It's early in the wee hours of the morning when I hear it. A long note from far away. A low, human-like whistle. It's not bird song or an instrument. It's someone out there. Something out there whistling. I rub my eyes and sit up, looking across the room out the circular attic window that faces the pasture and the woods beyond it. The sheep are all in the barn tonight, so there's only one thing out in the field. It's difficult to make out. It's too dark. Only the moon illuminates it. It's dark black, whatever it is, standing up on its hind legs like a person. The only thing about it I can fully make out are its two golden yellow eyes, like glowing pool balls in its head, turned to face my window. I feel that vertigo again, like I'm going to fall over, and it lets out another long, piercing whistle. I draw the curtains shut tight and crawl back into bed, pretending like I never saw it there, even as it continues to whistle. When I wake up again, it's to the jarring sound of Luann's shrieking outside. I'm shocked awake, rushing out of the room in my pajamas. I fear the worst after last night, even if it was only a dream. When I open the front door, everyone is standing out in front of the porch. Luann has her hands over her mouth. There is a vomit on the ground in front of Dash who loons heavily against the porch railing. I walk down the steps almost on autopilot, blood going cold, and eyes as big as dinner plates when I look out into the field. It's like a sick art piece in the pasture. There is a tall Y-shaped branch stuck into the ground, about the height of a stop sign. The ends of the branch are sharp into points so that Whatever monster made this could stab its prey onto it. There are five robins on each half of the Y, stabbed on through their skulls and bellies and wings, mangled and bloody. Around the base of the branch, there are more dead birds, their stomachs split open and guts on display for all to see. They litter the field in a ring around the branch. I feel sick. I can't move a muscle. My hands are shaking and I feel like I'm going to pass out. It's only when I notice James storming up the stairs of the porch past me, swearing like a sailor that I snap out of it. I bet it's those dang kids that just moved in down the way. I'm gonna show them a piece of my mind, I'll tell you that much. He snarls, slamming the door open and thumping up the stairs. Luann and Prudence rush after him hoping to calm his nerves, but I stay. Dash isn't doing well. I wince when he throws up a second time, letting him breathe. I'll, I'll clean it up, okay? I say gently, even though the thought of it makes me want to join him in throwing up. 
He looks up at me with a weary look on his face. Yeah, he mumbles. I wanted to say no. Yeah, of course, man. Come on, let's go inside. I say, mustering a weak smile. It takes a long time to clean it all up on my own. I managed to keep last night's dinner in my stomach at least, so that's good. The garbage bag is heavy when I toss it into the trash bin, and my gloves are soaked in bird blood. There's a sink on the side of the barn. I tug my gloves off and I start to wash my hands. The blood had soaked through and stained my skin with her blood, so I scrub and scrub, lathering up with the yellowing bar of soap, nearly stuck to the dish that balances on the basin. The blood running off my hands seems endless, swirling down the drain with the water. The stream stops, the pipes groaning weakly. My hands pull back instinctively. The tab quivers for a moment before a clot of wet mud and leaves and feathers splatters against the basin of the sink. Red and water trickles out of the tab after it in droplets. I hear it whistle out from the tree line. I don't want to look. I really don't want to look. The farmhouse feels like it's miles away. When I turn and rush back towards it, closing the door behind me with a resounding thud. I shouldn't have come here. The day after is tense at best. James is still angry about the vandalism. He really believes that the kids on the way did this. I don't speak up about what I think it is. I doubt they would ever believe me. But when James snaps about the kids throughout the day, I notice that Dashiell is quick to say that it wasn't them. I want to hope that maybe he saw it too. I tried to convertly ask Jim about the well. Luann made us lunch despite what had happened that morning, but our sandwiches grew cold on their plates. None of us had much of an appetite. I clear my throat. So, Jim, have you been planning on opening up the well for a while? I ask sheepishly. He looks at me, and there's a confused look on his face. Yeah, I only came across the thing recently. It's not too far off the property, so I don't know why I hadn't noticed it. We moved to this farm just about five years ago, so we should have found it sooner, yeah? I nod quietly. Yeah. Any reason you asked? He narrows his eyes at me. I changed the subject quickly, and the conversation moved on. Despite how on edge we all felt, we still had to work. There are bloodstains in the grass where the birds once were, and the sheep all avoid the place where the sculpture once was. I try not to think about it. I notice that Dash spends more time out in the field with me. I understand why. His job was supposed to be repairing the fence near the back of the pasture, near the woods. We're sharing coffee by the fence when he turns to me. Do you think it was really kids? He asked quietly. I look down at my cup of coffee, licks of steam floating off it in the cold air. I don't. Me neither. I swallow thickly and take a sip of the coffee. I don't want to look at him. Did you hear it last night? The whistling? Yeah, I heard it, he says. I breathe a sigh of relief. I go to say something, to ask if he saw it too. But we're interrupted by the sound of Ace snarling at something. When I look at him, he's got his fur standing up on end, teeth bared and drool dripping from his lips. He starts barking. I follow his gaze to the tree line. Those yellow eyes peer back at the three of us, glowing like Christmas lights. My ears ring as Ace continues to bark and snarl. I'm frozen where I stand. No matter how much I try, I can't force myself to move. I'm roused from my trance when I hear one of these sheep scream. Dash and I run towards the sound. The flock has already gathered around the poor thing. Laying in the middle of them, one of the sheep lays convulsing, 
Dash crouches down next to it, holding its head as it begins to cough and hack. We're silent with confusion and fear when it finally gets what was in its throat. A bloody clot of sticks and mud and leaves and feathers hit the ground with a splat, droplets staining our pants and boots. The sheep go still, eyes glazed over like cue balls. We don't have much time to mourn the poor thing. We explain to Jim and Lou Wayne that it died of a seizure, which I suppose is true in some part. They both seem upset, as does Prudence and Dash, but they don't take the time to mourn. It seems like they were all too exhausted to do that. We herd the sheep back into the barn. I am closing up the barn doors when Dash comes up to me. Jack, do you think that we let something out? He asked. Out of the well? I asked him. My throat feels dry. Yeah. What do we do? I look at him like he has two heads, putting the latch down on the barn door. What, what do you think I would know? I don't know. I guess you're just smarter than I am, he mutters, not making eye contact with me. I mean, I think you are, I don't know. Jack, I just think you would have a better shot at it than me if we're just going by horror troves. He laughs weakly. I laugh along with him, but it comes out dry and tired. There's a long moment of silence between us. I tentatively glance out to the tree line behind him. I don't see anything, so that's lucky, I guess. I think that we have to cover the well back up. We'll go there tomorrow evening after dinner, nail some planks back on it, and it'll all be over. Dash looks relieved when I say that even though deep down, I get a sinking feeling in my gut. I can feel its eyes on me again. So I turn away from the woods and I gesture for Dash to follow me back to the house. It's late at night again when I hear it again. The whistling is closer now. I don't want to look out the window. I really don't want to look, but there's some part of me that forces my legs to move. I peek out the window in there, out in the yard. There it is. It's like a wolf standing on two legs, teeth yellowed and saliva dripping from its lips. It whistles again, and with it, I can hear its heart beating, probably below the black cape that it wears around its body. I don't want to look at it, but I can't stop myself from staring, staring down at its huge, bulbous, golden eyes staring back at me. I stare at it until my legs buckle, and I hit the floor with a thump, passing out into a cold, dreamless sleep. No matter what weird trance that thing put me in that night, hearing Jim cussing like a madman is enough to wake me up. When I do, there is blood staining the sheets. My hands are wet with blood. My legs feel like they're a 100 pounds each, I'm shaking when I walk down to the bathroom. The sink turns on with a squeak from the old metal taps. The stream of water washing away the mess. I don't know where it came from. I don't know how it got there and it makes me want to scream. It feels like I ran a marathon last night. My hands ache and my arms feel as heavy as my legs do. I look up at my reflection in the mirror. My eyes are red and bloodshot. Dark bags under them make me look five years older than I am. No matter how much I scrub my hands, the stain is still there, dried with my skin. I keep scrubbing, soap and water and blood swirling down the drain. Mentally, I'm begging it to get off of me. I squeeze my eyes shut and try not to scream, hoping that when I open them, it'll be gone. I open my eyes. Behind me in the mirror, I can see two glowing golden eyes through the sheer shower curtain. Blood dribbles down my upper lip from my nose. My throat goes dry. The water feels cold. I feel cold. I grab a tissue to stop the bleeding, holding it up to my nose and turning the taps off. I rush down the stairs, slamming the bathroom door behind me. When I make it to the main floor, I stop in my tracks. After what I saw in the bathroom, 
I had almost forgotten what woke me up in the first place. The front door is open. I want to throw up. There's a rabbit nailed to the front door by a spike through its body. Its blood has long since dried, but the smell of death lingers in the air, not helped by the line of four other dead rabbits, each split open on a different step on the porch. I know that Jim is yelling, and I can hear him storm past me to get his gun, but I can't make out what he's saying. My ears are ringing too loudly. I feel sick, my heart rate speeding up and my head feeling woozy as I stare into the blank, milky eyes of that rabbit. Something doesn't want me here. Something hates me so, so much that it would do something like this just to send a message. Something hates me so much that it made me do that. The ringing in my ears only grows louder. I squeeze my eyes shut, and I can see it. Last night, moonlight above the pasture. I moved on my own. Even though I didn't want to, it wouldn't let me go. It left the rabbits for me. It left these spikes that held the wood over its well in place. I was asleep, but my eyes were open. I thought it was a dream. I thought it was just a nightmare. I opened my eyes again, heart thumping in my chest and bile rising in my throat. Nobody is looking at me. Nobody knows what I've done. I look around the room. I look at Dash. I can't force a single word out of my throat, but he looks back at me and nods. He walks away and I'm left in the room alone. We understand what we have to do without saying anything to one another. I wish that I could be as brave as him. I wish that I had never looked out my window last night. It has to end tonight. We don't bother with breakfast or lunch that day. We've all lost our appetites. It's right out to the field with me. Dash is tasked with fixing a broken part of the barn. I'm glad for it. It means that he can survey what we have to cover up the well. The only issue is that it leaves me alone in the field. I wish that he were here to stand with me. Even just having him around makes me feel less afraid. But he's not here. I can see Jim over at the house, scrubbing at the front door to get the blood stain out. Guilt roils in my stomach and it makes my hands feel sweaty. There wasn't anything I could have done, but still, I feel like crap. At least it'll all be over soon. It's not long now. I'm broken on my thoughts when I hear a low whistle from the woods. I whip my head around. Looking out to the tree line before her, I hear a loud shout from the barn. Dash. I don't even realize that I'm running until I'm almost at the barn door. Rushing inside while I hear the sound of Jim coming towards the scene as well. They keep the building supplies up in the loft. My heart drops when I see Dash on the ground. I'm frozen in place, eyes wide and hands shaking. No, he can't. He can't be. I'm unstuck when I hear him groan in pain. I'm at his side on my knees in a moment, but not sure what to do. His left arm is bent at an odd angle, a pool of blood leaking from the back of his head. My hands fumble in the air above him, as if there's something that I can do. I can't stop shaking. Sweat beads on the back of my neck. Tears filling my eyes and making it hard to see when Jim rushes in. I hear him swear. I hear Dash respond weakly from the ground, but nothing registers. All I can hear is my heart pounding out of my chest. In my head, I can hear a whistle piercing like the sound of a gunshot. There is nothing that I can do. There is nothing I can... Jack, what the hell are you sitting around for? Jim's shout snaps me out of my stupor. I hear him on the phone calling an ambulance and I look down at Dash. He looks back at me, blurry-eyed, and clearly in pain and he murmurs to me, Can you do it on your own? It's getting dark out. I'm at the farm by myself. Everyone else is at the hospital with Dash. 
The sheep are all on the barn, and the pasture is quiet. The rusty wagon I drag behind me squeaks rhythmically, weighed down by the two-by-fours and tools inside of it. My headlamp lights the way, and Jim's shotgun is heavy in my free hand. It feels like a funeral march. There's no sound in the air, not an owl call or cricket, just the squeak of my wagon and the sound of my footsteps. It doesn't take long to find the well. The sky is red and the sun is dipping below the horizon and spilling its light through the trees like wine. I come to a halt next to the well. It's as deep as it ever was, seeming to go on forever without an end in sight, fading to an inky blackness that makes my stomach turn. I don't dwell on it, picking up the power drill and getting to work. I'm anxious of the setting sun, trying to get the job done as quickly as possible, drilling holes for the spikes to go into. I'm losing sunlight fast, but the fear of whatever the heck came out of the well lights a fire under my butt. The nails sink through the wood with a thunk each time, making me feel less and less scared with each board. I'm fitting the final board into place, ready to drive in the final spike, when a whistle cuts through the air. I whirl around, eyes darting about. I glance up at the sky, seeing these stars staring back at me. I hardly notice the sun fading away. I fumble for the shotgun, and I hear the whistle again, a long, low tone right behind me. I don't want to look. I don't want to look. My hands are shaking. I've never fired a gun before in my life. I'm going to die. I turn, letting my eyes stay open just enough to make sure that it's behind me. It's there, standing across the clearing for me. Heads taller than me, eyes glowing like headlights. I squeeze the trigger of the shotgun. The bang rings out through the woods, echoing through the silent trees. It hardly flinches, while the recoil throws me back against the well. Rather, it rushes at me, charging. It opens its maw, all yellowing teeth and a wet, slithering tongue. A gaping throat that's as inky black as the bottom of the well. I dive out of the way, and it snarls like a thousand angry dogs. I scramble away from it and it gives chase, shambling towards me on all fours. Its cape falls open and I can see its ribcage exposed below, skeletal, and in the center is a pumping, rotting heart. I stumble around, turning to it when it skids and runs into a tree. I pump the shotgun and the shell falls to the ground. I raise it up, aiming for its heart and I shoot again. This time, it screams in pain, jaw hanging wide open, and eyes going even brighter. I let out a delirious laugh at my own luck, only for the thing to charge again. I go to run, but I've backed myself against a tree. Its massive clawed hand wraps around my torso and lifts me up like I weigh as much as a baseball bat. I kick and yell, struggling in its grasp. It drools without hunger without even meaning to, clearly because it doesn't lift me up to eat me. It grins broadly, and it makes eye contact with me. I want to look away. I can't. I stare back at it, into those light bulb eyes that make spots appear in my vision. It whistles, and blood drips from my nose. The whistle echoes in my ears and it turns into voices all saying different things, laughing, talking, crying, weeping, screaming, all echoing in my brain and making my head hurt. I can't make out the words, but I know what they're saying. I know what they're saying. You never should have come here. You never should have opened the well. You never should have asked Dash for help. All of this is your fault. None of this would have happened if you had never come here. 
I can't move. I'm frozen in its grip. Blood leaking from my nose and hands quivering. I want to throw up. I want to scream. I want to call for help, but I can't. It opens its mouth, lifting me closer. I surrender myself to it. I think about my parents. I'm never coming home to them. I think about my friends. I'll never hear their voices again. I think about Dash and his family. I'll never be able to apologize for what I've caused. I think about Dash. I feel its breath in my face. And I feel my arm move. I muster all my strength. And I bring the shotgun up. Jabbing the butt of it into its eye. It roars, curling in on itself. In its rage, it throws me across the clearing like a misbehaving toy. I feel my leg collide with the well. A sickening crunch, sending staring pain up my leg. I scream in pain, panting for breath. My vision goes white for a moment, but I shake my head even as tears prick at my eyes. The well. I'm next to the well. I drag myself closer to the well, huffing and panting and gritting my teeth. I hear it, begin to run backwards towards me as I lift the hammer up, and I bring it down with a loud, final thunk. The monster roars out, screaming through the trees. I squeeze my eyes shut, and even as I do, I still see the blinding light that flashes as it disappears. And I wait. For a minute, that feels like years. And I hear crickets in the woods. Exhaustion finally seeps into me, the pain of my injury hitting me with full force. I let my eyes slide shut, and I hear the sound of birds and bugs as I slowly drift into blackness. When I wake up, I hear the sound of a heart rate monitor, the sound of gurneys being pushed around and distant chatter. No whistling. I breathe a sigh of relief. My legs feel like hell. I sit up in bed, looking around the room. It's a hospital, obviously. The family must have found me. My assumption is confirmed when I look over and the curtain is drawn back to another one of the beds. Dash is sitting in it, looking over at me. He's got a cast around his arm and a bandage around his head. He's beaming at me. What? I ask, my throat hoarse. I can't keep the smile off my face. His grin is infectious. I'm glad you know you didn't die, he responds. It makes me laugh a little. I'm glad I didn't die too. Did you tell them to look for me? I asked. He nods. You did it right. I think so. He sighs, clearly relieved, leaning his head back into his pillow. Whatever tension was there melts out of him. We should be resting, he mumbles. I can finally sleep. Yeah, we should, I agree. I'm not much for conversation. Not right now. It's only a few minutes before Dash is snoring across from me. I close my eyes trying to drift into sleep. And then I hear that whistling in my head.